I want to tell you that uh, we went down Wednesday evening, Judy and I, to uh, spend Thanksgiving with her parents in Pensacola. And uh, the evidence of Hurricane Ivan was uh, still evident. But it wasn't until Thanksgiving morning that uh, Granddaddy and I and... uh, Stephanie and Emily got into the automobile. We left Judy behind to fix Thanksgiving dinner. And uh, I said to Granddaddy, can we get down to Alabama Point? I don't know. I said, you haven't been down there? No. I asked uh, Judy's brother Glenn, you get down? No. I asked her brother Johnny, you been down? No. I mean, here they are. They live 10, 12 miles away from all this devastation and they haven't been there. And the reason they haven't been there is they're in the middle of devastation. And they're just trying to put their lives back together. But I wanted to go down to the coastline. And I'll preface what I saw there by telling you that um, I was born in 1942. And in 1942, World War II was well underway. I was born a month after Pearl Harbor. And uh, all during the war, when I was one, two, three, and four years of age... There was rationing going on in this country. Now some of you are old enough to remember what rationing was all about, and most of you are not. But I remember. I remember because even when I was two and three and four years of age, my father was engaged in a business that required him to have fuel for his business and tires on his vehicle. And gasoline and tires were rationed. Lots of things were rationed. And I can remember my dad talking about, I need another tire and they're not going to let me have a tire. And I don't know how I can work if I can't get another tire. Well, during those war years, um, my father's brother came home from the service on leave. One of these R&R things and he had... 30 days and he came home and I can still hear him saying to my father, Herschel, I want to go to the beach. And I can remember my dad laughing at him and saying, James, you don't know what you're talking about. We have to have gas to go down there and get back and we have to have tires. And he says, look, I know enough buddies. He says, we'll get the gas and we'll get the tires and we're going to go to the beach. I want to go to the beach. We went to the beach, Gulf Shores. And Gulf Shores was woods, and animals, and sand, and nothing. There were hardly any people go Gulf Shores. And if you could get there, you could go as far as Alabama Point, and there was this water, and you couldn't cross. Over on the other side, you could, you know, stand there and look and wish, but you couldn't get across. Well, through the years, of course, Gulf Shores and all along that part of the Florida coast on the other side of the water there have grown and grown and grown and high-rise condos up until there's hardly anything one would recognize from 1942, 43, 44, 45, etc. And through the years, uh, we've watched this place being taken over by concrete, and people. We kind of have our favorite places to go down there when we go down to visit Judy's parents. We like to go to Alabama Point. We go down from the Florida side. Now there's a nice bridge across there. And uh, we go there because it's a national seashore and it's a state park and there are not very many people and lots of sand and lots of water and you can just go there and enjoy yourself. And I want to go to Alabama Point. And so we went there. But to get there, we had to pass through several miles of devastation. And I'm sharing this with you because uh, my message this morning is the unthanksgiving. And the folk who live down there and the folk who own property down there are not enjoying a very nice thanksgiving. It's just not possible. 
if you see that devastation, and I think we were quite fortunate to go there and get through, actually, because there were police cars and police cars and police cars, and then at the Alabama... Florida line, there was a car, a police car, and he was literally in the middle of the road. And I suspect, and Granddaddy rather confirmed this for me, that you probably wouldn't have gotten down here any other time than Thanksgiving Day because of all the work and the construction and deconstruction and everything going on. They probably don't want gawkers down here. And they allowed us to go through, though they were giving us the eagle eye all along the way. Not only did we get through to Alabama Point, which I'll describe for you in a moment, but we actually got across the bridge and went over to Gulf Shores to Orange Beach and right down to where Highway 59 comes from Foley and dead ends at Gulf Shores. I want to tell you that pictures do not do it justice. TV cameras and helicopters don't do it justice. You have to be there and you have to actually see with your eyes to understand. Many of the buildings there are built in such a way that the first floor is what they call a washout floor. The water can actually go through and take the walls out and anything that's down on that first floor and leave the upper stories, you know, intact. But evidently the wind and the water were fierce enough and high enough that they went through not only the first floor on several of those along two or three miles of shore that we saw there, but they got up in the first and second and third floors, and there were mountains of mattresses that just washed out of condos, and tubs, and commodes, and sinks, and furniture, and people's belongings that were just, you know, swept away. And I thought, my, my, these people are not enjoying Thanksgiving down here today at all. In June, it's really hard for me to try and sort out what kind of blessing will come out of that for them. If they were adequately insured, I'm sure that, you know, they'll get a new dwelling back or a new piece of furniture back or whatever. But I wouldn't wish this kind of trouble on anyone. And let's face it, there are things that happen to us in this life that it's really difficult to see some blessing in it. Several of you know that our son-in-law George fell off a ladder a week or so ago, a week and a half ago, up here in Birmingham, doing some construction work. They had put a new deck on this house, and the deck was slippery, and the ladder just went, and George just went. And he spent a week in the hospital. And uh, my first reaction was, boy, we don't need this. And George didn't need this. And all of the pain, and he's in considerable pain. And forget the bill, I mean, you know. And you think about these things and you wonder, is there some blessing in this? And then you have a little time to reflect on it, and I want to tell you that uh, there's much to be thankful for, even in a tragedy like this. What if he had had such an accident a hundred years ago, and they couldn't perform the surgery, and they couldn't administer something to dampen the pain? What if this had happened in another part of the world? What if? But because we live in this great land that we live in, he had access to proper medical care and to a well-trained surgeon who could put that arm back together, we hope, without any lasting effect. He had access to equipment that someone had to invent and someone had to manufacture and they had to be able to do that CAT scan and take those x-rays and someone had to be trained to read those things and someone had to construct that hospital. Someone had to do all of these things. And yes, it was a tragedy, but 
it could have been a real tragedy. But for the blessings that we take too often for granted, I want to talk to you about the unthanksgiving this morning and tell you that the opposite of a thankful heart, the opposite of thankfulness and gratitude, is selfishness and pride. There are some very interesting passages in Scripture when we start talking about thankfulness and unthankfulness. But I, I, you know, I'm reminded of what Paul wrote to Timothy about the last days. And one of the signs, one of the marks, Paul said, that will indicate the last days have come. He says there's going to be people who are unthankful. See? Unthankful. And he adds to that, unholy. To be unthankful is to be unholy if we haven't ever thought of it in that way. And to be thankful and to have a heart filled with gratitude is to approach holiness. And we need to practice giving thanks. Now, I'm a whiner, you know. If you ask me if the glass is half full or half empty, it's half empty. That's just my personality and that's the way I look at life. I'm a whiner, but I also find things to be thankful for. I have to struggle to get there sometimes, but I find them. I find them. And I want to tell you, having gone down to the coast Thanksgiving morning and seeing the devastation, not only at the water's edge, And by the way, it uh, removed several hundred yards of shoreline, just gone. The water's virtually up next to the highway now, and we used to have to hike for several minutes to get out to the water. But but as you're coming inland, the devastation continues, not for a mile or two, not for 10 miles, not for 20 miles, not for 30 miles, for 50 miles and 60 miles and 70 miles, and you keep coming. And the trees are just whipped right down. And the roofs are missing off of buildings and homes and cars where trees just, you know. And you think of the hundreds of thousands of people who were not adequately insured for something like this. And they're just taking the loss. I mean, it's on the chin. And having seen that, and having been here, as most of us were when that storm passed over us, I wanted to tell you, I'm so thankful that we did not experience more destruction here than we did. Because it's not too many miles and minutes down the road. And just like this tornado on Wednesday morning, it's just destruction. And of course, the Bible tells us were it not for the goodness of the Lord, we should be what? Destroyed. So the Lord looks over and watches over His children. There are some passages that I want to remind you of this morning and tell you that there are those who are unthankful. Jesus healed many people. And we have the record of, you know, those ten. And how many came back to say thank you? Just one. Just one. Now Jesus should have known, shouldn't He, that they were ungrateful and unthankful. And why would He waste His time and energy on people like this? Why would He come where no one really wanted Him to come? And why would He do the things that He did? And you and I can be thankful today that He did. And let us pray that we are at least one of those who has some thankfulness and some gratitude and express it to God. I'm in Psalm 92, and I want to contrast this passage of Scripture with Ezekiel and the king of Tyre and Lucifer, Satan. It's a good thing, Psalm 92 says, it's a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord 
and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. Upon an instrument of ten strings and upon the psaltery and the harp with a solemn sound, for thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the work of thy hands. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. There's something healing about a thankful heart. If a person is depressed and morose, if a person is down, not much healing takes place. Not much healing in the body, not much healing in the spirit, and not much healing for those around. But a merry heart doeth good like what? Like medicine. Giving thanks is actually lifting to the Spirit. When we think of thanksgiving and we sit down to the table, we give thanks for, you know, tangible things, for, for shelter things. We thank the Lord for shelter over our heads and food on our table. And when we think of thanksgiving, most often we give thanks for the physical, the tangible things. But there is thanksgiving for the spirit things, and that's what David is saying here. I thank you for your works. I thank you for your thoughts. I thank you for your highness, your holiness, and your goodness. And thanking God is actually a spirit response. It's something that we do in the spirit and if we are truly thankful and truly filled with gratitude, then there is an added blessing to us. Paul in Romans 1 talks about those who were not thankful, he says. And he goes on to describe their condition. And once again, they're unholy and they're unclean and their thoughts are impure, he says. Because they are unthankful. An unthankful spirit is selfish and proud and envious. Granddaddy said something while we were down for Thanksgiving that um, I've been thinking about since. And uh, it has troubled me. And uh, Thanksgiving evening, we came home and I went to sleep kind of early and woke up again and turned on one of the talk show programs and I heard something on the talk show program that reinforced what Granddaddy told me and I thought about it and it troubled me and it's been troubling me. And because I'm a whiner, I'm going to tell you about it. Granddaddy said as the tornado, not the tornado, the hurricane was coming into Pensacola, they had left their home and gone to what they believed was a well-constructed motel only to discover after the fact that it was made out of wood and not out of concrete. But they had gone to this place nearer the city center. And he said they learned that while the storm was actually approaching, there were some people in the town who got into their automobiles and they were not seeking shelter. They went on thieving, robbing binge. As the storm was approached, hadn't even gotten there yet. And their plan of action was this. They would go by the stores they wanted to loot and they would throw bricks and boards through the windows which, of course, after the storm, people would think had been caused by what? By the storm. They would throw rocks and bricks and boards and things through the windows, and then because the police were completely overwhelmed elsewhere, and because people had left their properties and their businesses and were fleeing for safety, why, they just looted whatever they pleased. And there were gangs of these people. And I tried to reason this in my thinking 
this is so troubling to me because I don't like to have people like this on the planet. And it's a good thing I'm not in charge of cleaning up things. And I'm trying to think through this kind of mindset. Because never would the thought ever occur to me. It would never even come into my mind that, boy, this is a great opportunity to go out and steal. This is a great opportunity to go out and tear up people's property. This is a great opportunity to go out and... And because such a thought never even crosses my mind, I'm trying to reason it out. How did it get into their minds? And it wasn't one or two or three or four. It was bunches of them. And Granddaddy said, while we were in the motel, they were a block away going through jewelry stores and... 7-Eleven stores and everything else just taking, helping themselves. And then he told me some more. And it upset me more. And because I'm a whiner, I'm going to tell you about it. He said that the devastation along the coastline was, of course, you know, indescribable. And it was immediately sealed off by the county police by the state police, by all the city and small burg police, and then they brought in the National Guard. And they sealed every road in. And the people who had gone into shelters, they wouldn't even allow out of the shelters. Now why would they seal everything off? Come on. The first, the first cause is to prevent looting Okay? Also, there were buildings, if you went into them, the thing could fall on you. I mean, we saw buildings three and four and five stories standing like this, and you went in there, the thing could just, you know. And people might want to go in there and try to salvage some personal belonging or something and then be killed. And so, they sealed every road off. But then, these looters decided they knew how to get there. So what would they do? They went out and got in boats and went out on the water and came in on the backside. See, I told you my message this morning is the unthanksgiving. They finally had to go for miles down the coastline and seal off every boat launch. They caught people going out and coming around in boats to loot. And then, of course, there was the talk show program that I listened to, and I wanted to tell you what I heard. <clears throat> this was a rather frank discussion of how human beings behave and why, after World War II, it was decided that we would not allow, we and the other nations that fought with us in the Pacific against the Japanese in World War II, why we would not allow the Japanese to rearm. Nothing like they had armed themselves before. Because they have this samurai spirit. And because we cannot let them just exercise this spirit again. They cannot be trusted, you see. Now, no one wants to discuss these things in today's political correct society. But then the discussion turned to Germany. And uh, this talk show person said, well, let me tell you how it is. In Germany, it is against the law to hold a Nazi rally. rally. You cannot have a Nazi party in Germany. It's against the law. It is forbidden by the conquering nations. And by German law. But you can come to the United States and you can actually go join a skinhead group. You can actually join the Nazi party in the United States. Well, why is it that it's outlawed in Germany and not outlawed elsewhere? And the reason is because Germany is full of Germans. And they have this fierce, warlike spirit. 
This conquering spirit. This better than thou spirit. And this great pride would swell up if it were allowed to exercise itself again. And you say, well, I'm really skittish about those Japanese and about those Germans. Well, the truth of the matter is, it's humanity. It's all of us. We might not have a Nazi party, but if we see someone abusing the flag, why we might, you know. The truth of the matter is, we are all selfish by nature. We're all proud by nature. We're all envious by nature. Let's go out and break through all these store windows and take what we want because they got plenty and we haven't, you see. It's the end thing today to hate America around the world. Why? Because we have what they don't have. Envy and pride. See, these things are exact opposites of thankfulness. John says over in his little epistles that you cannot love God and hate your neighbor. And if you do love God, then you're going to what? Toward your neighbor. And the Bible tells us that saying thanksgiving and praising God, see, is an expression of love. Now, where is granddaughter Emily? Would you come up, please? And I'll stand here by you. So if you miss a word or have trouble with a word, I don't think you will. Now, I must tell you that Miss Jessica has inspired Miss Emily. And Emily is in the second grade at Breakworth at the school there in Hoover. And she is just, she is reading very well. And I'm so proud of her, I want her to read Psalm 100 for us all this morning. Okay, will you do that? Make a, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pastures. In enter. enter his into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all nations. To all generations. Generations. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I want to tell you what I'm thankful for this morning. Above anything else, I'm thankful for hope. If this life were the only life, Paul says, we would be most miserable. If Christ is not resurrected, then we're without hope, he says. But we have hope. You and I have hope. And as long as you have hope, you keep breathing. You keep walking. You keep working. You keep on keeping on. As long as there is hope. I'll close with an experience I had in New Orleans. It was a sad experience. And it was a bad experience. I was employed at that time by the Southwestern Union. And I was doing follow-up evangelism for the Union. And I was spending five to six months preparation before the Union Evangelist would come in and hold evangelistic meetings and we would baptize as many as 
would be baptized. In one home in particular on the other side of the river that I called on, this uh, lady had purchased books from one of our canvassers and had paid for them, and I called at the home and introduced myself and uh, told her who I was with and that she had purchased books and that I wasn't there to sell anything. I was there to tell her that she qualified for a free Bible course and, and uh, uh, a study course that would take her into her books. And her face just lit up, but about that time her husband appeared over her shoulder and he did not have a face lit up. It was lit up, but the wrong direction. And he just rudely grabbed her and shoved her aside and said, She don't want none. And he was about to close the door in my face. I was standing on the front stoop. And he was about to close the door in my face. And she just let him have it. And she really gave him the elbow. I mean... And she said, don't listen to him, I want it. <laughs> and probably his behavior clinched, you know, her own decision <laughs> for something scriptural and spiritual and, and good and uplifting. Well, he went back sulking and fell down in his recliner over there. I could see him and he was looking at me with a real glare, you know, and she said, won't you come in? And I didn't know if I wanted to or not, but I dared to step in. And He was sitting there back in his recliner and he had his beer propped on the arm of the recliner like this, you know, and he started in again. Uh, you know, stepping in the door was, you're now on his territory. And he let me have it again. And I don't have to repeat what he was saying. But this is what he said that I remember to this moment. He says, you're just like all those other preachers come around here and tell me I'm going to hell because I'm drinking beer. And the Lord just gave me the words. I said, sir, I don't believe that. The man was so shocked he sobered up. <laughs> he just sat there and he looked at me with a dumbfounded look and he said, you don't? And I said, no, I, I don't believe that. Well, all those other preachers say that. And I knew what he was saying was true. This was a man without hope. This was a man who had already been told, you're lost, you're going to hell. Nobody cares about you. And if you don't turn your life totally around and give it over to the control of the Lord, you're going to burn forever and ever. Now what kind of drawing power is there in that? What kind of attraction is there in that? What kind of hope is there in that? You know. Here was a man who was grasping for straws, for breath. And it was, you know, it was just too evident. He didn't want me there because... I was just going to come and add to his misery. And what he needed, and I hope they found in that family and in the Bible lessons that I took faithfully two and three a week for several weeks, what I hope the man found was hope. Hope. If there's anything to be thankful for today, let me tell you, is that we have hope. Because God has promised that things are not always going to be the way they are down here now. They're not always going to be hurricanes filled with destruction. They're not always going to be accidents and hospitals and doctors and all the things that exact such a fearful price down here. Not always going to be this way. And we might wonder, well, how much longer is all of this going to take? I can't tell you. But I believe soon. I really believe soon. And today I'm living in hope. I'm thankful for hope. I'm thankful for every sign that I believe I have and you have that Jesus is going to come back soon.
I'm thankful. I'm thankful to live in this land where we have so much. And I'm not just referring to tangible, you know, monetary things. We have freedom. And we have a measure of peace. And you cannot buy it in most of the world. You cannot obtain it in most of the world. We can still get on the highway and drive from here to Oregon, Larry and Dorothy. But in Africa, you could only drive a few minutes and a few miles and there's another man with another gun and another handout. You have only to go over the border into Mexico and you'll meet the same fate. We are privileged, you and I, to live where we live. And we are privileged to live in the time we live in earth's history. As many problems as there are, and as many things that we might have to whine about, we have lots to be thankful for. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, I'm really thankful you're here today, and I'm thankful I'm here today. And I'm thankful that somebody worked real hard in the kitchen and prepared a nice meal. And we want you to come and share a second Thanksgiving meal with us today. Loving Father in Heaven, teach us how to be thankful. Help us to slow down and see that uh, in spite of the enemy and in spite of the curse that the enemy has brought against us, You're standing there. And You are ever ready to heal and to help. Ever ready to offer hope. And so we thank You today for Your goodness. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. I ask You to bless every family and every person here today. Bless our loved ones scattered wherever they may be today. And I ask you to come and join us in this hour and in this meal. Teach us how to look up. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.